I've been walking, walking, walking beneath streetlights. I've been walking, walking, cause I can't find peace on these nights. I've been walking, walking, but my strides are getting slow. Still, I'm walking, I'm walking, but I don't know where I'm going. I've been looking for love. But only found deception Told my secrets to some people Who have not kept it This is the Polish Ambassador Featuring the Grouch And Scott Nice Don't get it twisted I might be conscious, still I like to fuck I like it. Do a little yoga, then lift some weights up I be as I'm supposed to, perfectly imperfect Word. Indulge in deep combo, get hype when she What's going on? You like that music? That was from my boy, Jared A. Brown Thank you for joining a special edition of Smashing Kidney Disease This is your boy, Steve Belcher Man, this is going to be a great show tonight we normally don't do shows on Tuesday nights. We do and we don't. I mean, we done created so many different shows that smashing kidney disease, even though I have the uh, kidney disease education banner in the back, this is smashing kidney disease because the person I have on here tonight, man, she done smashed all the uh, stereotypes and myths pertaining to kidney disease. Share this broadcast because you're not going to get any information like this anywhere else. There's no other broadcast or any station that continuously uh, broadcasts and share kidney warrior stories across the world. So you're not alone. And it's people that deals with the disease in, their, in the way that they're able to manage that makes it work for them in spite of. And I have a person on here tonight, again, that if you've been following her, you've been seeing a lot of her inspirational daily videos as she read from Ayana Van Zandt. And so without further ado, from Cape Coral, Florida, I'm telling you, when you see it, you're going to say, what? She on dialysis? I mean, I know a lot of people hear that, and you know, that's how 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 tricky this disease is. But at the same time, that's how you can manage the disease. It's it's a feeling on a state of being and how you deal with it. So, without further ado, I'm going to give it a very VIP uh, intro. Without further ado, Melissa Tough. What's going on, Melissa? Hey, Steve. Welcome, Thanks. welcome. <laughs> thank you, thank you for having me. Oh man, it's a pleasure to have you on. And man, I'm just saying, your energy is out of this world. I mean, the first thing I noticed, and I didn't notice this, you know, when you came on backstage, but the first thing I noticed when you came on is that charm. Tell us about that charm you're wearing around your neck. <laughs> Um, actually, this is a safe passage over water charm, which, um, because I spent the day at the beach yesterday for my birthday, I decided to put this on before I got in the water. Um, and I got it when I was whitewater rafting in Tennessee. Oh, wow. Wow. Now I, I have some experience on whitewater rafting as well. Uh, it's class, class three, four, not five, but I had had an opportunity going on class three, class four rapids up in uh, Western Pennsylvania. Very exhilarating. I loved it. Indeed. Yeah. It is very yeah. exhilarating. Lots of fun. Melissa, do you hear all the time 
people saying you don't look like you're on dialysis? Yes. And um, because I'm single, uh, I tend to go on dates and people do not know unless I tell them. And I'm upfront with it because I, it's a part of my life. It's a huge part of my life. And I'm not about deceiving anybody. And I completely own it because to be honest, I'm just I'm grateful and proud that we have this as an option um, to keep us alive, you know, because uh, as you talked about on your show the other day with the God committees, this wasn't always an option for everybody. So, you know, we're in a different place these days. And um, <clears throat> I've just accepted that as part of uh, part of my experience. And so I look to bring as much education and awareness to it as I possibly can while still being positive and not wallowing in the um, sorrow that can be, <laughs> that can come along with it. <laughs> right. Now I asked, um, I reached out to you today and asked you before we start the show, if you can, if you had a past that you could read, because every day I, I just feel like, you put out a lot of good energy that needs to be put out there with people who deal with a chronic disease. And I haven't seen no one else do what you do. And I think it's so important what you do for as that reading and putting out that energy, that positive energy, so other people could get in that same space. Could you share uh, a reading with us? I would be happy to. So um, I actually, this one is from March 2nd, but it's a very powerful read. So this is the one that I decided to share. And <clears throat> it goes as follows. I open my heart and mind to be aware I must make a decision about how my day is going to be. As soon as you decide that you are going to be faith-filled, joy-filled, peace-filled, and filled full, you are going to have a good day. The moment you decide that you are not going to be beat down or weighed down, put down or run down, hung up or beat up, upset or set up, pissed off or blown off, you are going to have a good day. When you decide in your own mind that you are going to get grounded, be centered, stay focused, have a vision, accomplish a goal, complete a mission, pursue a dream, live with purpose, you are going to have a good day. As soon as you decide to accept yourself, celebrate yourself, correct yourself, authorize yourself, validate yourself to be who you are and to love yourself just the way you are, you are going to have a good day. If you decide to take just a moment, just a moment to get still, to clear your mind, to open your heart, to listen to the sacred voice that guides you, that protects you, that knows you and loves you, you are going to have a good day. And if you find you're not having a good day, it could be that you have not made the decision or taken the time to do what you know you must do to ensure that your day goes the way you have decided it should. Wow, very powerful. <laughs> Thank you for that. Sure. Um, now, your, your experience with kidney disease um, expands over, what, 20 years? Or about 20 years? As of yesterday, it was 24 years, yes. Wow. So I'm sure starting off dealing with this disease, you weren't always this way as far as with a positive <laughs> attitude. Can you just share your story and how you got to this point today where we're on here talking about your story? Absolutely, because I can definitely tell you I would have never thought that I would be considered an inspiration <laughs> or the poster child for home dialysis, as someone else mentioned. Um, I started out in 1996. I was admitted to the hospital with a um, possible kidney problem. Um, I was told that I actually went to the hospital twice prior to being admitted and was sent home both times. And it turned out that what I had was a UTI that when they sent me home both times, they never prescribed antibiotics for. And so it backed up into my kidneys and caused them to fail. And so as you can imagine, I was 
very angry for a very long time, especially when I realized that this was something that could have been totally preventable and I would have never had to experience this. But then um, I started reading a lot of, um, I don't want to say faith-based, but just more spiritual type of um readings and books and anything that I could get my hands on that was just more positive and sort of gave me a better understanding of why I was experiencing the things that I was experiencing. And one of the biggest things that I realized for me was um, I had to forgive. And that's hard. <laughs> like Forgiveness is very hard. And I had to forgive all of the doctors who I had felt that failed me over the years and um, realized that everybody is just human, you know, and that we are all here for a divine purpose. And perhaps part of my purpose was to experience this so that I could, you know, shed light on the areas of dialysis and kidney disease that need light shed it on them. And um, so I went through a process of a very long time of trying to find um, a religious practice or a spiritual practice or something that made sense to me. And so that was a, I would say, a big um, springboard in part of how I came to this a place of acceptance and gratitude for this condition, because um, I'm able to actually see the good in what is going on and my, you know, with the dialysis and, and just not going to the bathroom and stuff like that. So, um, it helped me sort of refocus my attention. And so I spent much less time being angry at people, especially for things that maybe they didn't even realize they did and being able to just forgive them and be in that space of gratitude that, you know, I'm still here and I have another day to experience this amazing thing that we call life. And it's a choice for me to either be sullen and miserable and take that out on everyone else around me, or I can try and be the light in the darkness. And so I think that's kind of just how I got to where I am today. Wow. Now, you had a transplant, correct? I did. Um, I was on dialysis. Um, I was on hemodialysis in center for nine years from age. I actually started dialysis on my 17th birthday. So that's why I was saying it's been 24 years because um, my diagnosis came on my 17th birthday. So I was on wow. dialysis from 17 to 25. And then I had my transplant. And three years in or three years after my transplant, I had a really bad rejection episode and they weren't sure they were going to be able to save the kidney, but they were. And so then I had eight more years after that. So 11 years total with the transplant. And then I have been back on dialysis now for five years and we wow. and I've been, I've been on the list that long, too. So. Now, M Melissa, at 17 years old going did you go to a pediatric facility or you went to an adult unit, adult how, unit. how was that experience Ex share that with us going to an adult dialysis unit at 17 years old well the i first know that word, must have been a eye opener yeah i was gonna say the first word that comes to mind is traumatizing um I went from, I was in a pediatric ward in the hospital and they would bring the dialysis machine to my room. And um, they basically just discharged me from the hospital. I was in for a month because I was a guinea pig essentially during that time. They didn't know, um, they were claiming they didn't know what caused my kidney failure. So I was getting chemotherapy, I had plasmapheresis, and then I had dialysis. I had a stroke because I had all of those uh, all three of those things in one day, one time. So then I, they discharged me and gave me some handwritten notes and told me show up at this place at nine o'clock in the morning. And this is where you're going to go for dialysis. And at the time, this was before DeVita was a big thing. So the clinic that I went to was actually inside a hospital. Um, I think it was owned by the hospital, if I'm not mistaken. And so I showed up and I was 
petrified because um, what I didn't add was at the time, I was also living outside of my home. I wasn't home with my parents. I had moved out when I was 15. So um, I was doing all of this stuff by myself. And so I showed up to the clinic and I started seeing all these people that had amputations and that they were just really sick. And a lot of them looked like they were on their deathbeds, you know, so it was just entirely traumatizing for me because I immediately, nobody had explained to me that it was diabetes and hypertension that mostly causes kidney disease and that most of these people in here were diabetic and that was what resulted in their amputations. So immediately I just thought, okay, they're going to hook me up to this machine and sooner or later I'm going to start losing limbs and, and things like that because it, it had never been fully explained to me. I was never told what to expect. And I don't know if they ever even clarified that. I just kind of learned after talking with other patients in the clinic, you know, how they lost their leg or lost a hand or something. Um, I, that was kind of how I learned was really talking to the other patients and you have nothing else to do for three and a half hours when you're sitting right next to someone. And I think actually back then they used to cram us in pretty tight. So we were, you know, almost touching distance. I could hand snacks over to the person next to me. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, it was, it was traumatizing. And I think if I had been put in a pediatric ward, it would have been a lot less stressful on me. So in the beginning, that also added to that anger and frustration and confusion that I felt because I also thought that every, you know, everyone was talking over me and like, I wasn't even there, you know, the doctors would talk to the nurses and then they're not commuting, communicating to me, which was what ended up leading me to go to college to study medicine so that I could understand what they were saying. And then I could reverberate it right back to them. And they would be wow. like, Oh, you actually get this. You understand. And I'm like, yeah, you know, but not through any help of yours because you haven't given me any information in layman's terms. You want to just lay it all out like I'm another colleague. So, yeah. Wow. Now, can you take us to the day you got the call for your transplant? Was it a living <laughs> donor or was it a uh, deceased? It was a deceased donor. Um, I had... Um, I'd actually like to go back because I know you did talk about um, on one of your shows being put on uh, that pediatric list. You're supposed to get a kidney within a certain amount of time. And I was originally listed with William Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, and they were slowing the process down so that I would be an adult by the time they got me listed. And when I went to, I ended up um, being listed with them for like three years and I felt like I wasn't, I was just getting the runaround the whole time and something felt wrong about it. So I ended up investigating University of Michigan's program and I got listed with them and they were the ones who actually had told me that if I was listed as a pediatric patient that I would have gotten a kidney within a year. And that was another thing that, you know, made, again, made me angry and frustrated that these, I felt like these people were failing me because if they had put me on the list from the, you know, the day or a week, even after I had started dialysis, I would have had a kidney within a year. I wouldn't have had to wait nine years. So, wow. um, but, uh, the call that I got, I had one dry one prior to, I was in line at a store with a cart full of groceries. They called me and said I was the backup. So I left everything there, went down there and it, you know, the first person got it, which thank God bless them because it, you know, was their time. And, um, the call that I got for the second one was the call that I actually got my kidney through. And I didn't really believe her at first. I thought it was going to be another dry run. And it was really interesting. And I always think that there's a divine plan for things. Um, back then, obviously, I didn't. But now looking back, I can say, yeah, I totally can see how this unfolded perfectly for me. And um, so I was in college at the time. And I had finished an exam that night that I was super stressed about. I didn't think I was going to do well on, but I actually did so well that I finished really early. And I had the rest of the evening to myself. And my um, now ex-husband was at work. And so I thought, well, I'm going to go to the casino because I kind of feel lucky tonight since I had just finished this exam and I did really well on it. 
And I was driving on my way to the casino by myself, which was definitely not something that I would have normally done. And I got a call from a number that I didn't know. And I answered it. Um, the woman on the other end asked me if I was driving and I said, yes. And she says, well, you're going to want to pull over. And I said, okay. And so I pulled over to the side of the road before she even told me where she was calling from or anything, pulled over to the side of the road. And she says, we have a kidney for you. And I just, I was shaking. Like I, I couldn't believe it. And then I, the next thing was of course doubt. So then I said, are you sure is this going to actually be a kidney this time? You know, and she says, no, this is for you. It's a perfect match. You know, so we want you to be down here tonight so we can start you on the meds and prep you for surgery and everything. And so I turned around and headed back home, grabbed my hospital bag, um, called my ex-husband at work, told him he needed to come home because we had to get down to U of M. And so we went down there. Um, I had my surgery Friday morning. And I never even, unlike a lot of people that I've talked to, I didn't even go into ICU. I went straight into a regular room and I went home Monday afternoon and went to class Monday night. Hey, Melissa, you still yep. there? Yep. All right. Sorry, my mic went down. Wow. Okay. So you went into a regular room? I went into a regular room. I woke up. I didn't have any tubes or anything. Actually, when I woke up in recovery after surgery, I didn't even realize that I'd had surgery. I had no pain. Um, I actually felt great, which was the only thing that I guess made me feel like, you know, something had happened. But I started questioning them, like, did, you know, what happened? Did the kidney not work or what have you? And they held up the bag for me and they were like no it started working right away and you're already making urine and blah 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 and so um it was it was just a really great experience i honestly couldn't have asked for a better experience i've had other surgeries that were less complicated that i've spent more time in the hospital for and i like hit the ground running afterwards i i was ready to go back to work in a week and they just wouldn't release me <laughs> wow now can you take us to the time where you found out that the transplant was failing? Sure. Um, well, originally when I was admitted for the rejection, um, my creatinine was 15. And um, I had, you know, like, like they tell you, you don't always know you're in rejection. I was working like 60 hours a week at the time. I felt fine. I was still making urine. I didn't have any inclination. I hadn't been sick. So I had no idea that I was actually actively in rejection and they found out because we go get our monthly blood and they had gotten my blood and my numbers were through the charts. So they wanted me to come down um, and have it investigated. Um, so I went through a lot of depression in the in that time because, you know, I don't know that it's always conveyed that it's not a one and done thing. So I kind of felt like, okay, I got this kidney, I got my life back and, you know, I'm three years out. So I thought I was out of the woods and everything was going great. I was taking my meds on schedule. Um, and then you're hit with this and it's a huge blow because, you know, especially when you're doing everything you're supposed to do. And, you know, I went through this whole like, okay, what did I do? Did I, you know, could I have done something different? Could I have done something better? Did I miss a dose? You know, I'm like, I'm critiquing myself thinking that I, I ruined this gift that I got. And, you know, it turns out that it just happens sometimes, unfortunately. And then I got hit with the news that in Michigan, um, with my antibodies and everything, they told me it would be seven to 14 years for another transplant. Wow. And, yeah. So, um, that was another thing where I was like, okay, so now I'm going to have to immediately, I just thought I was going to be starting dialysis again and that I'd have to be on it for seven to 14 years. And so I signed a DNR because I was refusing to do dialysis really? again because I'd done nine years of in center and sometimes it was pretty freaking terrible. You know? Right. So let me, What's I'm that? sorry. Let me just go back to that. Cause that's powerful. What you just said. Um, did you make, peace with yourself when you signed that DNR? I did. I, I think I was, I looked at it as, 
okay, I, I had a good run. I, I gave it all I could. And, you know, maybe this is just God's plan for me. You know, if there was a God's plan, you know, um, and I started, you know, making arrangements and connecting with people that I hadn't spoke with in a while to kind of make amends and, um, you know, convey my feelings and stuff. I was, I was planning to just die basically because I, I looked at it as I would rather wow. die than return to dialysis. And I was also not educated on home options, even though they were available at the time. I know they did, probably didn't have home hemo, but they did have peritoneal and I was never told about any of that stuff. And so that was, you know, my thought was, okay, my only option would be to go back on in center. And I don't want to do that because the other part about it is, um, I would, I consider myself to be an empath. So I am very sensitive to other people's feelings and emotions. And even if they're not like expressing them, I can still feel it, you know, like a heaviness and sitting in that chair, for almost four hours around a lot of people who are just, they're still angry. They have a lot of displaced anger and frustration and it's just not a pleasant p place to be. So it was emotionally draining for me, even though, you know, I would try to be as positive as I could. Um, I often found myself being pulled into that. So I, like I said, I just made the decision that I, I didn't want to go back to that. I didn't like the way that I felt. I didn't like the person that I was sometimes, you know, and I didn't want to feel like I was a burden either because at the time I was married um, and that I know it's difficult for somebody else to watch you going through that when they can't do anything to help, you know, and it gives them a sense of helplessness. And I, I didn't want my husband at the time to feel that way. So I just thought it was the best decision at the time. And um Thankfully, I did have um, eight more years after that um, rejection episode. So it was that gave me the time to sort of reconsider. And I actually took the initiative to really investigate other dialysis options and things like that. So once I pulled my DNR back out, I decided I was going to do peritoneal. <clears throat> and I made the decision to even against the most of the doctors that I was seeing because they were all kind of negating that and saying you should do in center. That's the gold standard. Hemo is the best. And my thought was, you guys are just trying to get me in a chair. You're trying to get me in your chair because I know you make more money when I'm in center, you know, and. So I stuck with my guns and kept shopping around for doctors until I found one that was like, yeah, we'll put a PD cath in you and, you know, we'll see how this works. And so, you know, uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say what, what trips me out when they try to convince you that incident is a gold standard, but yet we all know the more dialysis you have, the better you feel. You can't get no six, five hours incident unless you do nocturnal but if they don't offer nocturnal it's it's three to four hours 12 hours a week opposed to if you do say even five hours three times a week that's 15 I, I mean that's uh yeah 15 hours opposed to to nine hours if you three three hours three times a week so i mean they can go ahead with that bull crap yeah. it's the gold standard and all that well, and to me, I always try to explain it to people in the sense of, you know, you're getting 12, your kidneys work 365, 24 seven, and you're getting 12 to maybe 14 hours, depending on how long your runs are, you're getting 12 to 14 hours, three times a week, you know, and even just in the difference of from doing PD, because I did do PD for four years before I started doing home hemo. Even just in the difference that I feel between that, um, that does tell me that hemo does work better because it's cleaning your blood versus using your abdomen to filter your system. But the other part is that because I'm doing it for shorter amounts of time and I'm doing it over the space of five days a week, it's not as hard on my system. So I don't have that. Like I can I can get off the machine and go out for a walk and go about my business for the day. Whereas when I was on in center hemo, 
I would get out of there and I was done. Like I was tapped out. You had out. to go home and lay down. Exactly. I, I, I needed to go home and take a nap. And if that nap didn't last the rest of the day, I would be lucky. And even then, I wouldn't really start feeling good, I guess, per se, um, until it was just about the time to go back in. And then I start, started thinking, like, why do I feel better like on my off days and the days that I'm not, you know, when I'm getting ready to go back into dialysis, why am I start feeling better then? Like, shouldn't I feel better after dialysis? <laughs> you know, like I that's- heard that a lot when I worked in sin. A lot of patients say, uh, when I get off, Steve, when I go home, I got to lay down. I got to get something to eat because I'm so uh, tired. And then uh, they say they don't start feeling better until the following day when they got to come back Mm -hmm. to dialysis and repeat that whole process over again. And I think that's part of what what gets us down just generally, because you finally start to feel better. And then you're like, oh, crap, I got to go back in and do this again. You know, and then you you, you're repeating this cycle endlessly. And so you just you stop, you don't want to look forward to it. You know, there's, there's nothing to look forward to when you know you're going to walk out of there feeling drained and like crap. And, you know, if I know a lot of people that have kids and they're on dialysis and stuff. So I can't even imagine having to go home and care for your family after you've just had your whole blood system taken out three or four times over the course of that three and a half hours cleaned and then put back in. That's a very draining and intense process. You know, I know, no, I was just going to say, I know a young lady that's going through that now. Uh, I, I can't forget what state she's in, but she has three kids and, you know, have to pick them up from daycare and stuff like that after dialysis. I mean, when I think about stuff like that, it's just, it makes me sad. And that's why I do what I do because if people knew, you know, if they had something going on and had an opportunity to try to do something about it before it got out of hand, then this wouldn't be their new normal. Indeed. Indeed. And that's where the education and awareness comes in, because I think I've met so many people and even friends of mine that had no idea about what all of their kidneys do or what the symptoms are. You know, like with me, I felt like I had the flu. Um, I didn't have any of the typical low back pain, anything like that to indicate that it was a kidney problem. I just felt nauseous and run down. You know, Um, I was still working right up until the day I went into the hospital. And actually, my employer said that if I didn't go home, he was going to call an ambulance because I was so pale because, you know, your kidneys make blood cells. And I didn't know any of that. So. I didn't know that I was almost in cardiac arrest because for the week prior, wow. all I put down was milk. So when I went into the hospital, my calcium was like 21 or something, you know, and they were like, wow. we don't even know how your heart didn't stop. <laughs> oh, my God. 21. Yeah. Wow. It was, my numbers were crazy. They thought that I should have been dead when I went in there. And, you know, here I am. <laughs> my last name isn't just tough for a reason, I guess. <laughs> Uh, Mel, share with us, uh, oh, Kathy Perkins says, hope your birthday was amazing. It says, you look great. You do. Kathy. Yes. Um, Share with us, you had mentioned on Kidney Story with Uncle Jim uh, that you had to have $12,000 for your transplant. Yeah. um, Share that with us. Okay, so I didn't experience that the first time around. Um, In fact, I think when I was younger, I was overinsured almost because I had Medicare. And then when I got married, I had Blue Cross. And then somehow I still qualified for Medicaid as well. So um, this time around was very different. When I went to Tampa for my initial um, consultation to get on the list, I met with the financial coordinator. And because at that time now I was single um, and I only had Medicare. Uh, She pulled out a calculator, went over what my estimated share of cost was going to be for six months, the donut hole um, in my prescription coverage, and uh, the 20% that I would be required to pay as the balance from my Medicare. 
and came up with the figure $12,584. And that was what I needed to have in an account prior to them even considering listing me. So um, as you can imagine, that was overwhelming. Like I, I had an idea because I had been hearing um, things here and there about people saying they had to fundraise to get on a transplant list and stuff, but I had never experienced it. So I, I wasn't sure if it was just hearsay or if it was particular clinics that were doing it or, you know, what the, what the deal was. And then when I got hit with it, um, I, I, I honestly didn't know what I was going to do initially. Um, because I'm not close with most of my family. Um, so I didn't feel like I was going to have support from them where one of them was just going to say, here, here's a check for $12,584, get on the list. Um, and having just moved from Michigan to Florida where the list was shorter, I didn't really have too many connections here either because I was just restarting my life. So I had a few people that I knew from work and I had just become affiliated with a local spiritual center. and. Um, so I, I was just kind of at a loss and my um, spiritual center actually approached me and asked if they could um, use their upcoming fundraiser, which was a Halloween party, um, if they could use those funds towards my transplant. And wow. yeah, um, and, and mind you, I, I got to reiterate, I barely knew these people. I had, I think I had started at that spiritual center in... August or September, maybe, and the event was in October. So I'd probably been there about two months. And um, <clears throat> of course, I accepted it because I had no other means to really raise that kind of money. I had started to go fund me, but that was just, you know, a few donations here and there. Um, I make jewelry and, and crafts and stuff. So I was selling some of that stuff online. And you know, getting a little bit together. But I, you know, for me, I just thought, oh my gosh, this is going to take me another like two years to come up with this money on top of, you know, paying bills and stuff. So um, obviously, like I said, I accepted it. And that night alone, we raised nearly $10,000, I believe it was. So um, we did like, wow. Yeah. $10,000 um, in one yeah. night? Yeah. From people that I, from people that didn't know me from Joe Schmo, I mean, so I was, I was completely humbled by that because um, once word got out that they were going to be contributing the funds to my transplant expenses, we had people from the center that went to, um, some of them live in golfing communities and such, and so they went to like their homeowners associations and things and got them to donate like golf for four with the cart and everything you oh, know we know we know we know the people now florida got money <laughs> and, they, and they love their golf so um a lot of those things that's all that right and a lot of the things that were going for silent auction were like 900 and a thousand dollar packages wow. and yeah, so we had people donate artwork. We had, I mean, I had so many amazing things that came together for that event. Not to mention, you know, they were charging $20 a ticket for the event. And it was one of the highest attended events because not only was it the spiritual community, but a lot of those people were bringing their friends because some of them had been touched by kidney disease in some way. So it kind of, you know, it hit their heart. And to see a young person going through it, because I'm like the youngest person in the church. Um, it really, it really tugged at them, you know, so they wanted to do something to help. And I, I, I can't even tell you the amount of gratitude that I have, which is why I still serve for that center, because it really showed me what being a community was about and how coming together can make such a difference, even if it's just in one person's life, you know? So, um, I raised most of the money from that. And then I did some t-shirt sales uh, with Bonfire. And um, I had the money together in like maybe three months. And wow. um, I've, I've dealt with people since who have also went with Tampa and had to do fundraising and stuff. And actually one of the guys unfortunately gave up because he he felt it was overwhelming and he and I you know tried mm. to convey to him look I I don't know people either and it happened for me it can happen for you just as easily you know and I I was willing to put on fundraisers and stuff for him but sometimes men can be a little hard-headed <laughs> and um he didn't 
want to put himself in a position to ask people for things. So he unfortunately ended up passing away and never even made it to the list because he just didn't, um, he didn't believe it could happen for him. And, and I feel that that's unfortunate because I think, you know, the one thing that talking about all this, um, I feel like it creates the conversation for this being something that should not, it should not even be a question. You know, we, we shouldn't be asking people, how much money do you have in your bank account? Because I don't think your net worth is a, it, it doesn't give people a sense of what you can accomplish in your life. You know, that's just a snapshot. Right. And I was super offended that they were willing to put, put a price tag on my life. You know, like your life is worth $12,584 to us. And if you don't have that, then you're not worth it. You know, and that's kind mm. of how it felt to me. So, you know, I think that, I, you know, I love talking about it because I'm, I like people to understand that this is something that we shouldn't accept in our society. You know, it, it shouldn't be a question of how much money you can give us so that you can live. You know, we, we're supposed to live in the best country in the world, yet we're telling people that they have to raise money for a life-saving transplant. And I mean, that's just unthinkable to me, you know? Absolutely. And and the thing about it, Mel, is that even though a lot of people deal with kidney disease, we're not talking about the people who have yet to be diagnosed, right? We hope that doesn't happen, but in reality, each year, thousands of people are diagnosed with kidney disease that some move on to kidney failure right away, some catch it. But what, what about the newly diagnosed people that got to go through this process and then get placed on uh, a transplant list? They may have to go through the same thing you did, and they may not be as fortunate to be down uh, in Florida or at a place to uh, donate, you know, golf tea times and stuff like that. What would you suggest uh, to those individuals who find themselves in the position where they may be limited on trying to raise those funds if they needed to do that for their transplant uh, procedure? Well, I think. The first thing I always kind of, because I've never been one to ask people for things either. And I didn't even ask people to get tested for me when I was first diagnosed to get a living donor, you know, because I didn't want to ask somebody to give me an organ. That's, that's a major thing. You know, it's worse than asking for money. So the first thing I think is that we sort of have to get out of our own way. You know, we, it's, it's a humbling process, but I think that's the the blessing in it is that you know you do learn to be so much more humble and appreciative for just the general kindness of people that you may not even know and um I think that the other thing is that you know it's it's reaching out and opening yourself up to that assistance that is just out there in the universe for everybody because I don't I don't think that um it's impossible and I know that it's not impossible because, again, I, I accomplished it. And, you know, that was without the help and support of I have three brothers, one sister that I just found about. And then both of my parents are living. And I didn't you know, I didn't have big donations from any of them or um, I didn't even have them sharing my story most of the time, you know. And so. Wow. Um, I really truly felt like I was on my own doing this. And so to find people who cared about me enough that they were willing to help and not even me as a person, but just as a human being, you know, they, they, they saw somebody struggling and they knew how insurmountable the task seemed because I had discussed that, you know, I didn't have family involvement and some people, you know, they do have people that will put, my daughter's in need of a kidney or whatever on the back of their cars and stuff. And here I was driving around Cape Coral with, I need a kidney on the back of my car because I didn't have anyone that would do that for me, you know? So, mm. um, 
reaching out to people in your community, reaching out to, you know, if you have a, a spiritual home or a religious place that you um, frequent, reaching out to them because they think it never hurts to ask. The worst that anybody can ever tell you is no. And then you just ask again somewhere else. You know, I think the biggest thing is, is not giving up, you know, because at the end of the day, we're all worth it. And this is just a number that somebody's putting on our head. And if, if we allow that to get us down, then of course we're, we're not going to succeed in what we're trying to do. We have to stay optimistic about it and just keep trying. You know, if you fall off the horse, get back on. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, how did you push through those days when you were depressed, uh, when, when you was going through the rejection? How, how did you push through there? Because I'm sure there's a lot of kidney uh, warriors out here who, uh, you know, had transplants that had to go back on dialysis or something happened or didn't experience or just experienced depression in itself by having this disease. What worked for you to move past? I mean, we know everyone experienced depression, but what worked for you? For me, it was finding a sense of purpose and um, really connecting with that and remembering to do things that I enjoyed because, um, you know, as we all know, when you live with kidney disease, tomorrow's never promised. You know, it's not promised to anyone, but we face it a lot more in depth because it's it's right in front of us every day, all day. And we have constant reminders of these things. So. Um, I threw myself into work and really focused on finishing my courses in college because that was one of, you know, I, I set a tangible goal for myself that I wanted to graduate college with my bachelor's degree prior to um, going back on dialysis, if that was going to be the case. And I, I, I actually had a, um, there's a band that I follow. And so I started really, um, going to more more concerts and stuff because I, those were the things that brought me joy and i felt like the more time i could spend in in that joyful space um the happier i felt and the more fulfilled i felt and the less i thought about dialysis and the less i thought about the stresses in my life and and you know what could happen and all the what ifs and stuff so I really encourage people to find something if they don't already have something that they love, but find something that they love and, and just pour their whole heart into it. And I think when you do that, the depression sort of takes a backseat and you're you're not as focused on it because you have a distraction. Mm -hmm. Wow. That, that was powerful. That was and powerful. Actually, and actually, I want to add to that that. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one of the, the the band that I follow has a huge following and they're all like peace and love and hippies and stuff like that. And what you know, um, one of the one of the song lyrics states a line, be kind always, no matter. And um, I actually met a girl in one of the groups who did a paired exchange. And so I got a voucher for a living donor through the Cleveland Clinic because she was tested for me. We never met. And she flew down to Florida, was tested for me. We spent like three days together. She found out she didn't match, but she wanted to do whatever she could do to help me. And if it meant doing a paired exchange and that I would get a kidney and a swap, then she was going to do that. And so she wow. donated. Yeah. So she donated her kidney last August. It set off a nine person chain. And so her kidney went from Cleveland Clinic here in Florida up to Connecticut. And then, you know, they did the swaps back and forth. So wait a minute. Wait a minute. You met somebody, a total stranger. Total stranger. Who? We just like the same band. <laughs> right. But she, instead of you, instead of her giving the kidney directly to you, she donated to somebody else so you can get a voucher so your turn could come up. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you don't even find family members that do that for their loved ones. You know, you get people say, no, like 
somebody say, if you donate to somebody else, I can get a kidney. And they'd be like, no, I want it to go to you. And, and, <laughs> and you had a total person who y'all happen to follow the same band. How selfless of act of that to do that for you. I mean, yeah. that's incredible. And that just shows other people that if that can happen for you, that it can happen for them. It, we just don't know how the miracle was going to come. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I had, I mean, I'd had people tested, just like you said, that what, fine, when they found out they didn't match me, they stopped the process immediately. They, nope, if you can't get my kidney, I'm not going to do it. And even when I ex ex explained the paired exchange process um, and that, you know, it, it would possibly still get me a kidney, they had absolutely no interest in doing it and just stopped. And, you know, I only had one member of my family tested. So for a complete stranger, to be tested and then not only find out they weren't a match for me and when she could have easily stepped out of it and said no this isn't for me if she's not getting a kidney or if she's not even and she even did it when they told us that i wasn't going to get a kidney the same time you know which that's another deterrent for a lot of people um so when they spoke to us about the advanced donation we both had to sign forms um, stating that we were okay with the fact that I wasn't going to get get a kidney out of this exchange, but I would be given a voucher to the living donor list. So when somebody is added to that pool in that paired exchange, I will get a call. So, so how long have you been waiting? Um, well, she donated in August of last year. So it has been a year. And actually, she just reached out to me a few days ago because um, we kind of lost contact and she was wondering if I had ever gotten my kidney yet. And so she was like, well, I'm upset about this. I'm going to call the hospital and light a fire under there. But, you know, she's just like she was very active throughout the whole process and adamant that, you know, I'm not signing this form unless I know she's going to get a kidney at some point in the future because I'm doing this, you know, like because oh, I'm doing man, that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely pray that this comes sooner than later for you. I mean, because it's almost like, it almost feel like it's a layaway. It <laughs> I is. Mean, you know, it you're is. waiting to redeem, you know, that kidney. And I got a rain check. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Wow. I'm just waiting for that kidney to come into stock so I can go and cash it in, you know? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that that's awesome. Now, can you share with us I know you do a lot of positive reading, especially from Ayana uh, Van Zandt. What does that do for you with these type of um, inspirational readings, these daily readings? Oh, uh, before you say that, uh, uh, Candy wants to know what blood type are you? O positive. So that's why we usually wait the longest. <laughs> oh, okay. Well I'm also 98% sensitized. So I have super high antibodies because the um, cell set medication after transplant made me um, crazy anemic. And so for two years, I was transfusion dependent. And I actually got to the point where they were saying they weren't going to give me any more blood because I was getting two units every two weeks. Mm. And so they said, you know, we can't give you anymore because it's going to end up causing you liver failure because my iron stores were so high. I had to do iron chelation therapy 24 hours a day. So I was wearing another IV for that. Um, so, yeah, it was it was an interesting process. And yeah, but that's partially why I have had to wait so long and why the living donor thing didn't kind of pan out like they normally do, where you can just do an easy swap because I'm super hard to match. But they're still confident they're going to have somebody for me pretty soon. So, and I just, I know it's going to come in perfect timing. Like my last exactly. one, did. And my last one was a perfect match. So I'm happy to wait for another perfect match so that I can have another perfect experience. <laughs> oh, absolutely. But these readings, what have they done for you? Well, you know, I think that it's important for all of us to find um, spiritual food, you know, and that's what I call it is my spiritual food. Um, and for me, for a long time, it was the band that I follow. And I still, you know, I, I'm very moved by the message in their music because, again, they're all about positivity and 
loving one another and things like that. But the readings for me, um, and that the book that I share from in particular by Ayanla Van Zant, it, it's interesting because I feel like almost every message was written for me. Um, a lot of it has to do with healing. A lot of it has to do with taking responsibility for things and how they show up in your life and the way that we react to them. Um, so I, I immerse myself in a lot of readings that are similar to that. And, um, you know, it, it, to me, it's just, it's uplifting. And even if the message is something where I'm, it just like punches me in the gut because it's something I recognize that maybe I'm still doing, um, it's, it's knowledge. And I know that when I receive it, I'm growing from it, you know, and I think that's, part of what we're always here to do as human beings is, is to grow and evolve. And if we're stuck in the same place, just kind of spinning our wheels, we're, we're never going to get there. And so I, I feel that it's really important to read something positive every day to sort of fill your spirit with that. And so I start my day with that. I keep the book on my bedside. I read it first thing in the morning and then I read it again when I do the readings live on Facebook. Um, and then I read it again before I go to bed. And I think that that in combination with um, I meditate twice a day um, to like center myself and just sort of revisit the um, the things that I'm learning and it helps me to absorb it because, you know, some of us, I know we, we have what we like to call dialysis brain. <laughs> and so sometimes reading the stuff doesn't, uh, doesn't go through the first time, which is also why I read it more than once a day. Um, but yeah, I think that having a strong, uh, spiritual practice and whatever that looks like for you, you know, it's, I'm not saying go out and run and join a synagogue or a temple or a Baptist church or anything like that. I, I don't have, I don't even affiliate with a particular religion. I think that whatever works for you works for you, but it's important to find something. Mm -hmm. Now, Melissa, what's the name of the band that you follow? Kevin, uh, <laughs> Lucas asked. Dave Matthews band. And actually, um, behind me here <laughs> is, one Wait, poster. Put you solo. Okay. Behind you. Yeah. Behind me here is um, they have posters at all of their shows. And so um, when people walk into my house, I'm surrounded by them literally right now. There's two in my hallway here that you can probably see a bit of. Um, you play the guitar. I do. Well, I'm practicing. I haven't learned it, but it's one of those things where I set a goal. And so I do a little bit every day and I'm, I'm learning, you know, it's, it's, um, again, you know, I, it's going back to what I said, goal setting is important. You know, we have to have something to look forward to. And if you're only looking forward to dialysis, uh, you know, I mean, I hate to say it like this, but your life's going to be shit. <laughs> I mean, right. You're just being honest. I mean, yeah. Because I, I've done it. I've done it. I've been there. You know, I went through the cycle of where, you know, I, I had a period where I didn't work because, of course, I, I in the beginning, I was really sick. So I didn't return to work right away. And dialysis was a huge adjustment for my body because I, I went from being this active 16 year old and I was working almost full time at the time. And I went from being this active, normal kid to my life revolved around watching my diet, taking my meds and going to dialysis. And that I let that be my life for a while. And then I realized how dissatisfying it was and chose to make a change. Like I, I just I knew that this couldn't just be my life. You know, I, I mean, my life just couldn't be trips to dialysis or uh, inpatient stays in the hospital. I had to be more than that. And I was more than that. And I, I knew that life was about more than that. And Absolutely. so I, I made the decision to get more involved with things. I do a lot of volunteer work as well. I actually volunteer with Dave Matthews band. Um, wow. I've been looking at trying to, once concerts get back into, um, into play here after this virus goes away, um, I've been looking at affiliating with them in particular and then growing to other bands, but um, setting up um, organ donation registration stations at the concerts. Because oh, my God. That is how, awesome. How many people come through? I mean, you you have wow. 
thousand people at a concert and I know from volunteering with them how many people stop at these stations to get information from volunteers about things. And I used to, I mean, what I do with them is usually I'm selling water bottles or I'm registering people to vote. And people, I, I mean, just the amount of people that I've come into contact through those areas, I'm like, why would we not have an organ donation? Absolutely. Here? Because wow. this perfect time to get people and engage them before a concert. They're all happy. They're excited. They're, you know, and then you tell them your story and they're going to want to register because they're going to go, oh my gosh, I can save a life like, or eight lives. Because when you donate your organs, when you pass eight people are saved, you know? So yeah. And, I mean, that's crazy. Cause if you could do something like that today, Matthew's band, we could do it at rap concerts. Exactly. <laughs> that was my thought. I'm like, if I can start small with my circle of people that I know, and we could get it big and it could be at every concert. Like I could get to wow. where it's a contract with the venues where you just set up at every venue to register people. Man, I never thought about it. that's a great damn idea, Melissa. I mean, and not only just that, you could take it into sports. Um that's why I was saying, you know, if you get a if you were involved with the arena itself versus just the individual bands and promoters, if you can get involved with the arena, you can set up people at every arena across the country and for every event, you have a little table set up, you share your story, you register. I mean, even if you register 50 people in a night, which if you have 60,000 people attending an event, you're going to get more than 50 people to register. But I'm shooting, I'm saying low, on the low side, if you get 50 people, that's still a huge shift from what we're seeing in the registrations right now. Oh, wow. Yeah, please uh, let us know how you do with that. That's a great idea to further uh, spread awareness and education and getting that out there. Wow, never thought about that. Wow. I'm a <laughs> yes, you are. Um, so, you know, I told you we were going to be on a, about an hour. Uh, we had an hour, but it's one, one, another question I wanted to ask you um, if you can share. If someone is watching this program right now, and let's say they're at stage four, stage five, they're about to cross over or their numbers are high and they're about to get prepared for dialysis. Can you share any words of, of, of wisdom based on your experience when uh, you dealt with it as a teenager and, you know, experiencing as an adult with your uh, transplant failing? Any words of encouragement you can share with somebody who's about to approach this unknown process? I would say be gentle with yourself. You're going to go through a period of, it's like the five stages of death and dying. You, you're going to go through grief. You're going to go through denial. You're going to go through your acceptance. You know, you're going to go through all those stages. And it's important, I think, to just realize that it's just, they're just stages. And everyone goes through it. Everyone experiences it. You're not alone in it. And to be open to reaching out to others who have been through it, because I think sometimes we do try to tough it out. And I know in the beginning I did the same thing, you know, and then I, I had a great circle of people around me that I've met um, throughout dialysis and transplant who we've been able to swap stories. And I've learned so much from them that, you know, I wish that I had been more open to that much earlier on because I think it would have, it would have benefited me much more when I was younger and more rebellious and resistant to dialysis and the diet and all of that stuff. So um, I think that's, that's probably the biggest thing I would say is just, you know, take it one day at a time. And, um, just remember to be kind to yourself and, and however that looks to you, you know, for some people, the diet is the part that's daunting. So if it means that you treat yourself to some ice cream one night and that makes you feel better then then do it, you know, because as long as you're doing it in moderation, um, it's not going to kill you, you know, but you have to have things 
that still bring you joy in your life. You can't eliminate everything because then again, your life becomes just about dialysis and diet and pills and things like that. And that's not a life worth living. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Wow. And that, I guess that, that was, what you said leads me to my next question, uh, because I asked you for people who had stage four and stage five. But with this show, what I mean, let me just say this. We know there's a lot of kidney disease groups on Facebook. Uh, some like I hate dialysis, dialysis discussion. Uh, we have a couple raising awareness of kidney disease. But with all these different groups, uh, you know, we got different chatter going on. Um, you got people who experienced in dialysis, veterans who've been doing it a long time, giving other uh, advice and, and recommendations, people sharing that experience. You as a long-term uh, kidney disease patient, what's the biggest takeaway you want people who are dealing with dialysis, even veterans who may have done this longer than you, shorter than you, what's the biggest takeaway of uh, dealing with this disease? Um, for me, I think it's that we're all individuals. Um, not every one person is going to uh, respond to dialysis and transplant the same. And what I see in a lot of the groups, like you mentioned on Facebook, there can be a lot of negativity and misinformation. Um, there can also be a lot of personal experiences that aren't exactly fact-based because, you know, as individuals, we all have our perceptions of things. And I know um, one of the things I can speak of in particular was I had been told um, back when I was on dialysis the first time, actually, that I needed to have my parathyroid removed. And I refused to do so. Oh, because I'm sorry. Because yeah. this somebody watching needs to hear that. Uh, a friend of mine who's going through that uh, right now in the Mayo Clinic, I'm not going to mention her name, but the Mayo Clinic wants her, she was on the uh, transplant list for the Mayo Clinic and they put her on hold because they said her PTH was too high and they suggested getting a, paro a parathyroidectomy. Mm -hmm. So you refused. So how did you correct that issue? I know okay. everybody's different, but please talk, elaborate. Okay, so, um, well, I didn't exactly correct it because I, I really, I wasn't finished and I did end up getting it removed later, much later. Um, but when I was first on dialysis, I was told I was only on dialysis maybe a year or two, I think at the time. And they were like, you need to have it out. You need to have it out. And I just kept saying, no, I didn't, you know, I didn't feel like it was necessary. I didn't want them taking anything out of me that maybe could affect me later on. Um, and I had been getting information from other people who had had the surgery and had terrible results. And so I was basically formulating my decision to not do this based on what everybody else's experiences were rather than researching it and actually um, coming to my own conclusion. So I did put the parathyroidectomy off until I actually, I think it was, I just had it removed like maybe four years ago. Um, <clears throat> but what I will say is that um, I struggled with my phosphorus and PTH the entire time I was on dialysis the first time. And I mean, my phosphorus usually ran between eight and nine, like all the time. And so, you know, I was getting the dietitian stopping in my chair like every week, sometimes twice a week. Um, and my PTH, I think, was in almost the 2000s. And what I realized is <clears throat> after so long, um, your parathyroid can literally, even if your phosphorus is good, it will still keep pumping out that parathyroid hormone because it's been overworked for so long. So even after my transplant, my parathyroid was still pretty high and I was having to take calcitriol and Sensapar, which usually you only have to take those when you're on dialysis. Um, so I did end up getting it removed like four years ago and I did not have any of the issues that, um, 
that people were experiencing. You know, I had people saying they were having seizures and that their calcium was just super crazy low. And so now they had to take, you know, 12 different calcium supplements and stuff like that. But that wasn't my experience. And so it goes back to what I was saying about, you know, everybody's an individual. And I'm not saying that, you know, having a parathyroidectomy is the solution, but it did work for me. And now my phosphorus on dialysis this time stays in the fours and sometimes even lower than that. And I don't follow a dialysis diet like at all. I eat pizza. I, I eat um, hot dogs. I mean, I kind of I eat what I want and my phosphorus is still perfect. And um, my PTH is also under control. I also had a lot of um, bone pain when um, before they took it out. And that went away almost immediately after my surgery. So there was just a lot of things that, again, like I said, there's misinformation out there sometimes. And if we're not eager and willing to do our own research and become our own advocates, then we may end up making the wrong decision. And so, I mean, I may, I probably could have done my bones a lot of good by having the parathyroid removed years ago. And um, the other part was that the fear of the surgery, because, you know, you hear about how it can damage your vocal cords and stuff like that. Not like I'm a singer or anything, so I don't need them that much, but I do like to talk. So, you know, that was a real concern for me. Um, and, you know, as you can see, I don't even I don't even have a scar. I mean, it's it's like invisible. Um, and then the only one you can see is actually on my arm, which I don't even know if you can see it, but it's okay, right, there. right there. So, um, yeah, because they put one back in. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I I don't like I'm not a proponent for it, but I just think it's important to really research it. And if it, if your phosphorus and PTH has been a struggle for a very long time and medications don't seem to be working because, you know, even with the medications, I was on the highest doses of calcitriol and Sensipar that they could give me. And my PTH was not budging. If anything, it was probably getting higher. So um, once I did my research and found out that, you know, that gland can actually calcify and once it's calcified, it will, it will keep putting out that hormone because it just doesn't, it doesn't know any better really, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, that was my experience with it. And, you know, like I said, I'm, I just, I think it's good to be educated on it. Make sure you have the right surgeon. That's another thing, you know, the person that's taking it out, you don't want somebody cutting on your throat that's only taken 12 or 13 of them out. You want somebody that's done hundreds or thousands, you know, that they're very well versed in this um, surgery mm -hmm. um, because it is so sensitive, you know, and there are people that if you're, it's very important to keep your calcium up because if your calcium drops, then, you know, you do, you can't have seizures, you can die. So it, it's a scary idea to have to have it done in which, you know, again, that's why I put it off for so long and I live by myself. So I, the first thing I was thinking, I can't be having seizures in my house in Florida in a tile floor. Like, you know, if I didn't die from the seizure, I'm going to whack my head and die, you know? So wow. now one more thing before we go, I mean, I can go on and on. I, I, I'm <laughs> loving this uh, conversation. Thank you for taking the time out. But one more question uh, before we go. Now, you mentioned you live by yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, can you explain to maybe some warriors who may be watching, who may have thought about doing home dialysis, but they live by themselves? How do you manage to do that by yourself and not worry if something was to happen if you was on the machine? Sure. Um, well, I, I can start with telling you that the first clinic I was with, Davida, and, and we talked about this the other night on your other show, um, Davida refused to allow me to be a solo home hemo patient. And that's because obviously there are risks involved. Um, and not to mention the fact that nobody lives with me at all. So, and I probably, they took into consideration that my family's not nearby as well. So it's not like I could call my dad or somebody um, to come and help me. So um, I changed clinics because I was determined that that was going to be my course of action. I was going to do so, solo home hemo. I was not going to burden anyone else with my care because, of course, that's the first thing they suggest is, well, don't you have a neighbor or a friend or somebody that you can have come sit with you and, and things like that? But I'm a very independent person. And 
I just didn't want to have to ask somebody for that because not to mention, um, you know, I've had friends over when I was doing dialysis and I've seen how it affects them. And it, it's, it's kind of, it's sad for them. Cause again, you know, it's a feeling of helplessness there. There's nothing that they can do, you know, and constantly during my treatment, they're like, can I get you anything? Is there something I can do? And I'm like, no, like, you know, I do this five days a week by myself when you're not here. So it's totally fine. Like, um, so I, I basically tell people, you know, if it's something that you have your mind set on doing to be vehement about you are willing to accept the risks and that whatever you need to sign, you'll sign to release them of liability and that you want to do it at home. Because I 110% believe that doing it at home is the best way that you can do it because you are creating the environment. And I, I mentioned the other night that I, I make my dialysis experience a meditative experience. I light incense, I put on meditation music. And so that two and a half hours flies by for me. Whereas if I was sitting in a center for two and a half hours, I'm clock watching the whole time. And, it, and I end up making myself sick out of just anxiety and stuff from sitting there and looking around and wondering when I'm gonna be done and things like that. So my suggestion is honestly just, Educate yourself on the process. If you're comfortable with doing it by yourself, then make sure if you have to change clinics and doctors, which is what I had to do, then do that because um, it's completely possible and manageable to do it by yourself. I have um, my spare bedroom set up as like my clinic room and I have um, I keep my phone by me. So if something were to happen, which I've had two incidents that were pretty scary. I had one where my venous needle came out during my treatment. I had like an hour to go. And so the machine is obviously running. I've got blood spurting out of the needle. I've got to shut the machine off while I have to, I had my chin actually, cause my graft is in my upper arm. So I have my chin holding down on my arm to stop the bleeding on that while I was turning the machine off. But once I, did all that and was able to catch my breath, I thought, okay, you know what, if this is the worst that could happen, then I got this, you know? And then I actually had another incident where um, I had to, to have them change my machine out because I had air in my line and it's actually supposed to stop before it gets, like the machine is supposed to alarm and stop before it gets to the first clamp on your line. And mine, I noticed the air was all the way up almost at the needle hub. And so that was very scary because I could have very easily got a embolism. And um, so, you know, those two scary experiences, I think, were enough to make me realize, OK, so if I can make it through these, then I've got it. You know, I I I can handle this. And. Um, you know, neither time I had to dial 911 or anything, but in preparation, because again, I live by myself in case something were to happen, I leave my door unlocked during my treatment so that EMS can get in easily if they needed to. Um, I also have a window in my, in the room that I do it in. So I open my curtains and stuff and usually keep my window cracked a little bit in case I were to need to yell for help or anything. So it's just, being mindful, I think, of your surroundings, which is easier to do and easier to control when you're in your own home. Um, but with the fact that I'm doing it five days a week, I'm also not having the experiences that I had in center where my blood pressure would drop very quickly and without an alarm because they're pulling so much fluid off. You know, I'm average. I went from getting three to four kilos per treatment pulled off to sometimes I'm only doing a half. And actually today and yesterday I was under my dry weight. So I didn't even dialyze today because I was like a kilo under my dry weight. So she told me just to skip today. So wow. um, you even had a day off. huh? <laughs> I get an extra day off. I only got to do four this week. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's awesome. And I saw in one of the groups, I'm not in a lot of groups. Don't follow them, but I saw one where a guy, oh, I got into the group because you shared, um, and I hate dialysis. And so I just clicked on to I hate dialysis. And um, I saw a guy saying that he was taking off nearly six liters every treatment. That is a lot. That's like 13, 14 pounds of fluid. 
It is. I've been there. I mean, when I was doing three day a week dialysis, when I was younger, the first time around, I wasn't very compliant. It was hard. You know, in the beginning, I was very strict. I felt, I mean, I literally ate the times of day that when they discharged me from the hospital, I was on the hospital schedule. I ate at 8 a.m., 12 p.m. and 4 p.m. And then I had my snack at eight. Like, I, and I was eating what they fed me usually like tuna fish and, you know, just very bland things. And it, that's, again, where I started feeling like this is not a life. This is not a quality of life. And I, if I have to live this way, I want to have a quality of life. I want to be able to enjoy things that I like to enjoy. And when I'm pulling four or five kilos off in a treatment, which, you know, four or five doesn't sound like a lot, but when you multiply it by two times, you know, 2.2, 2, it, it is a lot, you know? It is. When you think about all of that coming off of your heart, which, you know, that's something I don't think we talk about a lot either with kidney disease is that it's not the kidney disease that kills you. It's usually cardiac failure, you know, and it's because your heart is being so strained when you're doing these three days a week treatments, they're pulling all of that blood and toxins and fluid off of you in such a short span of time. That's a huge stress on your body. So doing it daily through PD or doing it, you know, four or five days a week on hemo is so much easier on your body. And I think it just, I think it speaks volumes to the quality of life that you can have and how life extending it can truly be. You know, I think this is the process of how it was really meant to be, how dialysis was actually made to be in the first place. It should be a gentle process for your body and not as taxing because again, we go back to that's where most people end up losing their lives is to either congestive heart failure or some other type of cardiac incident. And it's not really addressed enough, I think, in our community that we have to do whatever we can to protect our heart. And if that means doing dialysis at home, then that's what it means, because I think ultimately that's the best way to do it for anyone. Wow. Wow. This has been an awesome show. Um, I don't even know where to start. Uh, well, first I want to start. I'd like to bring you back on again. Um, and if Jared, I don't know if Jared's watching, we'd like to ask you to co-host Warriors Quest. But we just want to keep in touch with you because you bring a lot of, of wealth, of information, experience. And, you know, you've followed us. And 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 um, you know, shares your experience throughout a lot of the broadcast. I mean, we have so many uh, response people um, that can identify with you, um, from reading the Dave Matthews Band to uh, Renardo Alexandra, who is a, a transplant recipient, motivational speaker, pastor, youth mentor. He does amazing things as well. He's like, your energy is absolutely amazing. Well, thank I you. mean, I, for some reason, I, I, and I'm not just saying this to say this, even before the show, when you was coming on, I, I felt your energy like I, it was just unbelievable. Like all the way up into this show, um, I, I couldn't wait. Um, and well, thank then, you. And I, I appreciate you having me on because, I, you know, I, I completely am in awe of what you do for the community and education and awareness and everything that you talk about. is It's just so relevant and nobody's touching on these things. So I, I appreciate you, Steve, for everything that you do for all of us. Oh, oh thank you. Because, you know, Melissa, um, even though I don't um, work in dialysis anymore, I, I think... I got to a point where it would be selfish of me to take all the experience that I accumulated and and do a, do something totally different, like go into another field and take all that experience where that can probably help someone. And you know, I just decided to do what I'm what I'm doing. I think God had that plan for me. Absolutely. And yeah, you're all along. Helping so many people. So just know that we appreciate you. Oh, thank you. And I mean, you had a lot of people who responded. Um, 
I see yep. my girl Heidi was on here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She um hashtag male needs a kidney shit. Hashtag share your spare. And then um guy Martin Pito, he deals with kidney disease. He's not on dialysis yet, but he appreciates the experience. I mean, and then Kevin Lucas. Lucas, I forgot where he's at, but I know he's out west in the mountains somewhere where it's hard to get internet reception. And he he does PD. And thanks for watching, Kevin. He says best interview to date, which I mean he's he's probably right. We didn't have some great shows, but it's your energy. It's you. it's your energy. Seriously, uh, he says that you are a shining star for kidney disease, tough lady. I mean, so I appreciate do you do that. any awareness or anything like that other than the daily meditation uh, readings? Um, awareness in a line, like as far as energy work and stuff? Well, kidney disease, like just... Okay. Yeah, um, I actually volunteer with LifeLink, which is the local organ procurement organization. Um, so we do booths. I mean, obviously, right now we're kind of on pause with the coronavirus and stuff, but um, I've volunteered with them for a few years now. So we do health fairs. We do, we, you know, they go out to colleges. I actually belong to a local transplant support group. And because they used to have a kidney transplant program locally here, like in my area, um, Gulf Coast Hospital, um, they're kidney heavy. So we do a lot of awareness and education uh, in that realm um, through our group. We have like an annual fundraiser where we bring people um, and educate them on kidney disease and stuff while we give them a night of entertainment. Um, I also volunteer with the AAKP, so I've been to a oh, lot of. AAKP. I love, I love, um, I love Aaron and, and Kale and, and Diana and Richard yep, and yep. all of guys and, over there. Yeah, and then I, I volunteer with the National Kidney Foundation. So for the last, I think four years, I went to DC to um, help them lobby for the immunosuppressive medication extension for Medicare and the Living Donor Protection Act. So um, I've done a lot of stuff with them. I actually was, um, I have a, a friend who works for the local newspaper. She did several stories on me where I was on the front page <laughs> talking about kidney disease and raising awareness for it. Um, and she did a lot of investigative journalism in it because she was floored by the fact that I had to raise money to get on the transplant list. So she really wanted to dig into that. And so we we did a good job of creating a lot of awareness around that because people didn't understand their risks for kidney disease. And so she was she printed all of that information. Um, we actually participated in a health fair where they would um, do testing to find out if people were predisposed to kidney disease. And um, so, yeah, I've, I've been blessed to be put in contact with a lot of great groups and great people who have been able to kind of give me a platform to um, be able to spread awareness. And then, you know, I actually had a website up until last year and then it let it lapse and I bought a new one. So I'm going to be creating that again. So that's another way that I um, create awareness. And then, um, like I said earlier, I make crafts and jewelry and stuff like that. And I sell them online. And so my business cards, my actual, my business is second chance creations and resale. And so on my business cards, I have the link to how to register as an organ donor. And then I have some information, like actually one of the backs of my cards has like the 10 myths and misconceptions about organ donation on it, because I think that seems to be the bigger struggle um, for a lot of people in getting them to register to be an organ donor is, you know, the, the myths in the urban legends that go around about it. So sure. that's kind of one of the forums that I really like to um, talk about because the reason that we have such a long wait for organs is because of the lack of donors. And so I, I believe that we can um, really, if we can educate people more, then we're going to have more people that are willing to be donors. And then <clears throat> in turn, we'll see a huge reduction in the amount of people that are having to wait for these organs. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, if we can't 100% 
pre 100% prevent people from having to go on dialysis or get a transplant of any organ. Um, the least we can do is educate people on organ donation and increase those um, the amount of donors that we have so that way we can lower and lessen those wait times. Absolutely. Uh, do you have one of your cards? With um, you? I do not. Well, oh, actually, okay. I just, I <laughs> yeah, guys. So if anybody's interested in picking up some jewelry from her, some positive energy, uh, share your information if anybody want to reach out to you. Well, I do uh, have a I do have a Facebook page for my business. This is my business card, and so I specialize in uniquely repurposed creations. And so that means, like, I like to take stuff that would normally go in the trash and make new stuff out of it. So, like, nobody uses VHS tapes anymore. And I made a coffee table for someone recently using some VHS tapes. And I've made umbrella stands and I make lamps out of cassette tapes and things like that. So, um, that is pretty much like, you know, wow. I've given a second chance and. I could have been thrown out to the trash, you know, and organs get thrown out to the trash all the wow. time. It's been a huge thing for me to like recycle and repurpose and give new life to things. Wow, that's awesome. Amazing. Wow. Anybody you would like to say hello to, Mel? Um, well, I do. I did see a couple of people that I know. Valerie is from my uh, spiritual center. So I want to thank her for joining me tonight and Heidi, of course, because I mentioned her husband actually had a kid or ex-husband, I think it is, sorry, um, <laughs> had a kidney transplant. And they actually um, helped me out with uh, Prograph at one time because I had fell into that 36 month where I'm running out of my Medicare and I had lost my coverage. And so I was struggling to get my medications and they were able to help me out with that so you know again i like leaning into that community is really important because you never know when you might be in a situation of you need a ride to dialysis or you might need uh, a couple days worth of medications you know and and you can't just walk into a pharmacy and expect them to give you a thousand dollar drug you know just on the fact that you need it so um and uh, my friend Jonathan also, Heidi and uh, Jonathan are also Dave Matthews Band followers. And so that's how I met them. They're all really great people. Oh, and that's awesome. Here go uh, Jonathan Thomas. He says, go <laughs> Mel. That's awesome. <laughs> I mean, just a, a great, great story. I mean, and this just gives hope to a lot of people that, you know, just don't go and stay focused on dialysis day in and day out. Continue to do what you were doing if you got that energy to do, you know, whether it's arts and crafts or whatever hobbies you were doing, it doesn't have to be dialysis day in and day out without uh, still living your life. Indeed. And if you can't do the things that you used to do, you know, if it's more physically taxing things, you know, I always suggest find something new, find something else that draws your heart to it that maybe doesn't require all of that, you know, find something else to pour yourself into because we have to have a purpose. And that's the bigger thing, because I think that when you're on dialysis, you can get lost in that whole process. And if you don't have something that's bringing you joy and giving you a sense of purpose and giving you a reason to get up in the morning, besides just, you know, oh, I'm doing it for my family or what have you, because again, I'm a perfect example of that. I, I have no kids. I'm not married and I don't have my family nearby. So I can't lean on that to say, okay, I'm doing this for my family. I'm doing this for me because I want to live and I want to have a, a good life while I'm here on earth. You know, I want, I want to try and make a change. And mm. so even if that just means getting into being an advocate, you know, there's plenty of groups that need advocates like the AAKP, the NKF, you know, there's a lot of foundations that need volunteers, you know, find something like that, that you, you know, where it allows you to even share your experience because talking about it even helps, you know? And I think that when you can share your story and honestly feel like you're being heard, it's, it's healing, you know, it truly is because, you know, you, you honestly just start to feel when you're just surrounding yourself with doctors and nurses and they're hearing everyone else's stories every day, you start to feel like just the number. and 
it's important to set yourself aside from that because you're not just a number. You are an individual. You're a human being. And so, you know, if, if that's how your clinic treats you, find a new clinic. You know, if it means you have to drive a little further or what have you, I mean, I, I followed my nurses wherever they transferred to when I, when I was younger, you know, because I knew who I wanted to stick me and who I didn't. And sometimes wow. I was driving, I was driving an hour each way to go to dialysis, which when you're already in there for four hours a day, and then you're having to drive an hour there and an hour back, you know, that's, that's a lot. Six, seven hours out of your time. Exactly. That's a full time job, you know, and that's the thing is you do you you have to look at it as more than just that. You know, it is a job and you're investing your time in it. But whatever you have to do, you know, if it means like Kevin saying, you know, it's you started a he started a hobby and, you know, into a business. If it means, you know, if you like woodworking and you can do that from home then you know, do something like that, create something for yourself and. To me, you know, the crafting and stuff was sort of just a therapeutic thing. I, I don't consider myself very artsy or creative, but you know, I work with what I have. And mm. if people buy it, then they buy it. But if not, then it was still, it was for me. You know, it made me feel good to make it or, or to do it. And it gives me something to do with my time other than just thinking about when am I going to dialysis next or what am I going to have to take my phosphorus binders, you know, or, you know, it's, so it's like, mm. it, it's, it's trying to create that division between and that balance between your life outside of dialysis and your life that is happening because of dialysis, you know, like what you're able to accomplish and still be here to do, you know, because not everybody has that luxury. When we, when we look at other countries, even they don't have the access to dialysis that we do. And I know that it's, overabundant here um unfortunately but at the end of the day we still have to be grateful for the process itself and just knowing that we have this as an option to keep us alive because if we needed livers or hearts or things like that we don't have life extending things that give us years and years and years to wait for an organ you know so finding those little blessings and things and and not just taking them for granted, I think, is is really important. You know, you have to have something to strive for and you have to have a positive outlook. You can't just be humdrum all the time. Wow. Well said. Wow. Wow. Now, again, we definitely got to have you back again, Mel, please, uh, to share your story or any, uh, you know, positive uh strength and hope you know at different time we definitely want you back and i want to ask jared brown to reach out to you to co-host warriors quest that's on wednesdays at 8 30. um so not tomorrow but any future wednesday you will uh we definitely would like for you to come back you well, give us a lot of hope i would be happy to and i like i said i appreciate you guys giving me the time and i I'm just happy to be able to share anything that might help someone, you know, because I, I again, I, I wish that I would have had this 12, 15 years ago. You know, this is this has probably only been the last, uh, I would say, like seven or eight years of my life that I've been able to kind of flip things around and, and take some of that power back that I feel like I lost over all those years that I was just handing over to these nurses and doctors, you know, not to. Um, down anything about nurses because I, I trust me i love nurses sure, and everything. Sure, absolutely. Um, <laughs> but you know it, it, we do have a tendency to just especially when you're in center to just go in there and not even be a part of the process to just kind of go on autopilot you know you're and right you're that's right one of the things i think is the biggest to avoid because you're turning over all of your power to them and when you feel powerless what else is going to happen you're going to feel helpless you're going to get depressed you know so once we can take more control of our care and of our outcomes i think that in and of itself helps to create a little more optimism and positivity in your life well said wow all right, Mel. Well, we're going to end on that note. And again, thank you so much for coming on Smashing Kidney Disease. Thank um, you for having we, me. Oh, absolutely. I look forward to talking with you uh, in the days ahead and having you come back on to share inspiration, hope, 
and guidance for people who deal with this disease. Thank you so much. All I'm right, happy. Melissa <laughs> Tuff, all the way from Cape Coral, Florida. Have a good evening. We talk to you soon. All right, thank you. Bye. All right, bye bye. Guys, this was an awesome show. Now, please, the people who came on for with Melissa, please support us by sharing, liking our page, Urban Health Outreach Media, Urban Kidney Alliance, or Warriors Quest. Please like, share, follow. Uh, we do shows, uh, four, sh four to five shows a week. So we would love for you to come back. We have great shows, great information, and we just try to give you uh, raw, uncut. So if you are dealing with this situation, you can make an informed decision on the information that you get. Uh, Thank you, uh, Candy, for watching, Kevin, uh, Jonathan, Renardo, Martin, Heidi. Um, There's so many people. Uh, Kathy Perkins, uh, God bless you, and congratulations, being 13 days post-transplant. Lisa Baxter from the Lisa Baxter Show. God bless you, Renardo. Thank you, brother. Heidi, George again. Um, just want to make sure I didn't miss anyone. Jonathan Tra uh, Trailer, thank you for coming on. Joyce Monroe. Guys, thank you so much. Audrey, uh, Bella from the uh, Sisters Against Kidney Disease host. Guys, again, thank you so much. This is what we need to elevate this community into the mainstream to put kidney disease on the radar and like dad by TV say, kick your kidney disease to the curb. So with that being said, have a great evening. Love you guys. And uh, tune in tomorrow night for Warriors Quest at 8.30 with Jared A. Brown. And then Thursday, I'm telling you, it's gonna be a hot show. We got a social worker who used to work for DaVita that's going to be on Urban Reno Talk with Tamika and Steve. She got blacklisted, y'all, because she was in a hospital with complications during their pregnancy. And they blacklisted her. How dumb does that sound? And you say, is that for real? Yes, it's for real. When you have an administrator that could be racist or don't like you, yes, that can happen. Um, let see, I got three comments I want to see before I go. Um, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sade. Um, we got this, boy, just tune in Thursday because it's going to be a hell of a show. Like I said, we're going to have a social worker who used to work for DaVita for two years. She gave it her all. She put all her energy in to help patients out just to be dogged out in her time of need. She put in the time of need to help others, but when her time came, she got blacklisted. And she's going to share her story along with myself as I share my story of being dogged out as a charge nurse with information to show. So we'll see you Thursday night, Urban Reno Talk with Tamika and Steve, and join us tomorrow night. Thanks, Kim, for watching. And join us tomorrow at 830 with uh, Warriors Quest with Jared A. Brown. God bless you guys. We see you soon. Peace. Oh, I've been walking, walking, walking beneath street lights. I've been walking, walking because I can't find peace on these nights. I've been walking. Walking, but my strides are getting slower. Still, I'm walking, I'm walking, but I don't know where I'm going. I've been looking for love, but only found deception. Told my secrets to some people who. Y'all was about to go down. I said y'all was about to go down.
British Ambassador. Featuring the Grouch and Scott Mays. I might be conscious, still I like to fuck I like it. Do a little yoga, then lift some weights up I be as I'm supposed to, perfectly imperfect Indulge in deep combo, get hyped when she's